This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today we present an address by urban planner Edmund Bacon, executive director of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission, and the man chiefly responsible for redesigning Philadelphia's central city and restoring it to the pedestrian. Mr. Bacon was introduced by James Sinatra, assistant professor of landscape architecture at Iowa State. Mr. Edmund Bacon is a, a writer of a book, Sign of Cities. He's appeared on Time Magazine cover, but I'd like, and he was the past director, just recently retired from the exec, uh, City Planning Commission of Philadelphia. But I'd like to tell you um, for a moment some of the things I think he's important for rather than his, his writing or um, maybe the, about the position that he has held. When we took a class trip, the landscape architecture students to Philadelphia this past uh, last year, one of the things, the highlight of the trip probably was about nine o'clock at night in the John F. Kennedy Plaza in, uh, in Center City, Philadelphia. At that time, the uh, Polish string band, which you know you hear the mummers strut, maybe some of you know about it, was playing. And a lot of Polish people um, that were doing the mummers strut. And the students were looking, and before we knew it, we were also doing the mummers strut downtown on the plaza in Philadelphia. And one of the students looked at me and said, is this really what a city could be like? Edmund Bacon. I really uh, like very much the fact that you came out tonight. And I also like the fact that many of you who came out are, I gather, Iowans. Uh, as I uh, wrote on United Airlines through the rather anonymous upper strat atmosphere, uh, I couldn't help sort of wondering why in the world I was going to Iowa. <laughs> And that's for two reasons. One, uh, what has Iowa got to offer me? And secondly, what have I got to offer Iowa? And I was met at the uh, airport by a very authentic native son of this state named Alan Woodrow, uh, who conducted me on a uh, guided tour of Des Moines. <laughs> and he uh, carried out some requests of mine, one of which was to see the Hubble Mansion, which he didn't know very much about, which is undoubtedly one of the greatest houses in the United States, and which I hoped was by now a museum and which isn't. Another thing we went to see was the Capitol building of the state. And I, I truly think that's one of the really great buildings I've ever seen, without any question of a doubt. And uh, one of the things that's so absolutely great about it is that it's all completely clear, and its inside is clearly what its outside promises. And uh, <laughs> I, I also think that the uh, expression of the many level functions is, is just marvelous. The place was filled with students who were, I don't know, looking at their government or their architecture, one or the other. And uh, at the lower level was that wonderful cafeteria. The only thing is 
that if I were governor, I would insist upon having a round table in that cafeteria right in the middle of the dome where I would enjoy eating my meals. And we then, uh, I, I am tempted to speak about Des Moines. I think uh, I will say one or two words about it since uh, we're on the subject and then I could say a little bit more about it later if anybody wants to ask me questions. But I do think that in terms of city image, that it's really a very marvelous uh, work and it's potentially considerably more marvelous than it is. And the feeling, I think, as you approach Des Moines from the expressway, uh, from the airport, rather from the airport, I beg your pardon, not the expressway, from the airport on the main highway, and you come across the great floodplain, which is, relatively speaking, a very uh, beautiful open space, and you see on the ridge the uh, magnificent Hubble Mansion, which gives you a wonderful impression, and then you go down Locust Street uh, through what is really a very decent main street. I was in Cleveland recently, and I have all the more admiration for Des Moines after having been in Cleveland. And uh, uh, you cross the bridge over the Des Moines River, and the whole business of that wonderful, I think of it as the upside down Romulus Remus Wolf, uh, uh, that uh, Capitol building of, uh, with its five domes, uh, and that wonderful axis up the hill is really superb. Uh, I do think that someday somebody's going to do something better about the connection between the river basin and the capital. Uh, but the issue involved in this thing is the tremendous area which was cleared adjacent to the river basin, uh, I believe north of the Locust Street Bridge. And after all, this is relevant to Cleveland, because in Cleveland they cleared away all this area to create a new environment, and then nobody knew how to create a new environment. Uh, <laughs> the uh, tremendous clearance there in this really wonderful relationship to what was actually a very clear structure of, of uh, perception on the scale of an urban community. And frankly, I have serious doubts in my own mind that anybody really knows how to put an environment back there again. And I think that that uh, is, is uh, uh, an indication that what we're talking about here is not just a lot of stuff. It's a very real question about whether the design profession knows how to cope with larger environmental problems beyond the confines of a single building. A very interesting experience which Ellen and I had this morning was to visit the American Republic Insurance Company building in Des Moines, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. I assume that everybody in the room has been through that building. Uh, we uh, barged into it, and we were given a guided tour. Uh, we saw the front courtyard with the sculpture, and we saw the lounges with their tremendous uh, span. We visited a typical floor, which had a marvelous clarity to it, uh, one of about eight floors, I suppose, and then we saw the executive suite on the top floor. And the guide said that the girls complained that they became very disoriented because when they got off the elevator, they had no idea where they were. Now, I, in a very, very deep sense, feel that what he said was important, and it's important about design. Because I feel deeply that one of the really important things which the design profession should be able to bring to every person is a continuous, meaningful sense of orientation, of position, of place, of relationship to some kind of a system of order. And I think that when you destroy that, you do the thing which, in the case of rats, is clearly proved to lead to physical, psychological, and spiritual degeneration. Uh, incidentally, in uh, Sweden, there is a school which was planned when I was about your age. And one of the things about it is that each of the separate floors, hallways of the school is a different color. And it's all based on the evolution from the Earth to the atmospheric uh, system of color hues. 
And roughly, as I remember it, it starts with a very uh, sort of warm uh, blue-brown at the bottom of a semi-earth color and goes through different progressions up to a very atmospheric type of light blue at the top. So that the instant that you step out of the elevator from vertical progression, you're instantly oriented to your positioning in space uh, in relationship to where you've gone. And as one of the principles of my work has been all the way through that you should be rewarded for effort. And this, of course, is the principle of dealing with rats. Uh, and as you move, you should have something new in the way of perception. Uh, incidentally, I am sure it isn't true in Iowa, but in the New York Thruway, you drive on your car over an expressway which is astonishingly uniform within its confines, and you stop because you're hungry or for some other reason at a Howard Johnson, and you go into a room and you buy a hamburger and coffee. You go back into your car and you drive 400 more miles, you stop your car, you get out, and you're in exactly the same Howard Johnson as you were. <laughs> and in, in, uh, in, in very practical terms, uh, I uh, will show you in my later work uh, in uh, the footways, the greenways through Philadelphia, that they're deliberately designed so that they focus on an immediately obtainable objective, which is related to the physical effort of propelling yourself through space. And then you come to a point of focus, a, uh, a, a terminal point, a vista or a tower, and you change direction and you get a new objective, which you then proceed to. And in this particular case, uh, uh, you get another objective. And uh, in this particular case, it's based on enveloping you with a whole series of different kinds of environmental experiences. And here, specifically, you go actually from the 18th century into a full plunging into the 20th century, where Yo Ming Pei completely surrounds you. And then you change your direction 90 degrees, and you go on to an 18th century church fire. Uh, now, along with these particular trips and as a counter experience in Iowa, I was also taken by my distinguished guide to two other uh, Iowa cities, one by the name of Elkhart and the other by the name of Huxley. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you, you laugh at that. I don't know why you laugh at that. I found that to be a really, really rewarding experience. I uh, do, on occasion, give talks. And it's really sort of horrible in the same sense as the Howard Johnson on the New York Thruway to get in an airplane and go to some city and go in a taxi to a hotel ballroom, give a speech, get into a taxi and go home. And you get no sense of place at all. And I tell you, I got a really deep sense of place in Elkhart. <laughs> I felt as though I had come somewhere. I'd experienced something. I, I agree that exactly what you experience in that environment is not easy to describe in a very simple way, but it most assuredly was an environment. And um, I, I uh, now move into my basic message, and it's a very serious message. And I honestly and truthfully uh, appreciate the privilege of communicating to you, who are here in an unvarnished way, uh, my very deep belief about this particular point. And I also say that, frankly, uh, this is a new, uh, well, a new insight in my own experience, a very new one. It, it's, it's a belief and conviction which I never, never uh, was uh, party to up to the last relatively few months. Uh, you probably know the reason I came to this institution is my old friend Jim Sinatra, who is on the faculty of the landscape architecture section and who was one of the very best people we ever had in the City Planning Commission, and I was very sorry to lose him to Iowa. But uh, <laughs> he is, uh, I think, your, uh, your beneficiary here. And uh, the fact that what I'm going to say may be remarkably parallel to his doctrine is pure and solely coincidence because we did not collude in any way and he had no idea and he still doesn't <laughs> what I'm going to say tonight. But uh, 
the, one of the reasons that it's uh, really exciting to me to be in Iowa to discuss this is because the conclusion that I've come to after a fairly long practice and a fairly intensive participation in the social and political decision-making process in Philadelphia is that the real key primary underlying issue of the whole thing is the land. And so help me, you got a lot of land out here. It's nice and black, I saw it. And you people are supposed to have a sense of the land, of the rhythm of the land, of the rhythm of natural forces on the land, of the demand which it conveys, and of the uh, discipline which it injects. And one of the most important single concepts which in my mind should come crashing through to all young people, whether they are civil engineers or theoretical planners or landscape architects or architects or any other thing, is that the real issue is what you do with the land and that every single square inch of God's earth has its own priceless individual identity. And that is the reason for my telling you the story about the people who got off the girls who got off the floors in the uh, American uh, Republic Insurance Company and were disoriented because each floor was exactly the same and it had no sense of place. And that's why I meant in a very real way that when you're in Huxley and, and Elkhart you have a sense of place. And that uh, if you once start to think this way, there is an amazing change in your attitude as a professional practitioner. Uh, I think that uh, one argument I had when I was in Salzburg with some foreign city planners, they talked about various categories of land use, including unused. And I said that there was no such thing as land which was unused. There was misused land, but there was no unused land. And uh, I think that in thinking about the land and orienting people vis-a-vis -vis the land, which is really the point, that you finally at last uh, come to the concept of all of the earth being a continuous dynamic flowing interaction of two systems of ecology. That the ecology of nature, which for instance Ian McHarg is giving us a new consciousness of in the East, you already knowing about it because you're Iowans, and the ecology of human institutions, which is the other system of ecology are simply in total interaction. And as you view the whole urban problem, the problem of the urban expansion of the outmove of the suburbs into the open country, not as an extension of land use or even a re in terms of, of urban land use or even an elimination of land use in terms of natural land use, but as a flowing interaction of two types of ecology, then the whole uh, image of all of the earth as, as a flow of ecological systems, uh, it becomes the foundation on which all professional practice is carried on. And then I think the job is to give all people a meaningful orientation to urban centers, to the uh, cultural and life advantages which they offer, to urban sub-centers, and to natural ecology and the relationships which they have. Now, uh, this, I think, is actually a far more revolutionary concept than it might appear on the surface. And I am an architect. I am a member in good standing of the American Institute of Architects and registered in two states. And therefore, I can say things about architects without flinching. And the uh, true fact is about the architectural profession that a vast segment of this regards the land as a convenient place to deposit a building. And as a matter of fact, I have made the point that the great problem of the architectural profession is white paper. And if we could really do away with paper completely, architecture would be much better off because the earth is nothing even faintly like white paper. And the, you immediately face the student from the beginning with the illusion that what he's dealing with is blank white paper. And you can't find a single square inch of God's earth anywhere 
which isn't already infused or injected with a huge history of ecological interactions which produces the fertility in the soil and produces enormously significant human institutions. And uh, the other part of it is that the paper has boundaries. And so help me, no architect ever dealt with a problem that had any boundaries at all because he's dealing with environment and environment doesn't stop. And uh, if you could have an infinitely large piece of paper, everybody always had to have instead of a smaller piece of paper. And then if it were very rough and went up or downhill, it would be at least better. But uh, the, I, I, in a very serious vein, believe that the image of paper and the fact that the architect starts with paper is a very serious detriment to the profession. And if you think that this is just a lot of sort of uh, 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 front parlor chit chat, I just remind you that the architects imposed on society the architectural image, and Le Corbusier was really the perpetrator of it, but the rest of the architects backed it up, that the real issue was to put people in vertical filing cases and to destroy all the humanity of the land and make it a large amorphous open space uh, and that that was the creation and that you measured the value of your product according to an abstraction of percentage of land coverage. And in the process of believing this image, which was injected into the political decision makers' minds by the architects, square miles of American cities were torn down, thousands and thousands of families, and especially poverty families, which depended for their survival on extremely intimate uh, interacting uh, institutions, which were rooted to a very, very sensitive character to the land, which was given zero value. And they were moved into these great vertical filing cases. The land, which once was meaningful to them in terms of institutions, was destroyed for any human purpose and became the battleground for uh, uh, gangs and, and uh, a dead element in the community. And you have such a situation as that project in, in uh, St. Louis, which is a uh, considerable extent empty now because of the consequence. So that uh, I, I think of the tyranny of the image. Uh, it, this is a, an example of an anti-image or a counter-image. Of course, I've simplified and I've irritated you all beautifully so that I will uh, have the happy uh, counterattack when you get a chance, which will be somewhat later. Uh, but uh, it, it, it still has a very important point. And a very important part of it is that whether you like it or not, you are injecting a, either a good or a bad image through your professional practice. Uh, incidentally, uh, what ought to happen is that the landscape architects, oh, by the way, in our discussions, I uh, met with some of the landscape architects this afternoon, and uh, I asked one of them who was working on a park uh, what he felt the function of the landscape architect was in relationship to working with the uh, regional planner. And he said, well, the regional planner will determine where the park is going to be, and then he will determine it over to the landscape architect to design the park, hopefully. Uh, if this is the way you think, you are already lost because by the time the regional planner decides where the park is going to be, it's already too late to be retrieved. And uh, the thing that uh, simply must happen is an entirely new, a completely, totally different integration of a whole range of disciplines, and that most assuredly includes landscape architecture, architecture, regional planning, and civil engineering. Incidentally, in my function on the uh, President's Advisory Committee on Environmental Quality, I suggested to Lawrence Rockefeller, its chairman, that he have a meeting of college presidents and deans, especially of schools of civil engineering, and put forth the idea that all civil engineers should positively be uh, uh, permitted and even, even uh, suggested to take a course in ecology as part of their fundamental training. But uh, what I think is that, well, I, I, what ought to happen is that the landscape architects ought to come out from under their self-imposed inferior position. And incidentally, I think the term landscape architecture is miserable. I think it should be called land design. Uh, that they should, in fact, assert themselves as the dominant element in the entire design profession because they at least ought to have sensitivity to the land and that the land absolutely must become the uh, underlying uh, element in 
all of these uh, different practices of architecture seen in ecological terms. And uh, that through this kind of new uh, thrust, there would come about what is most assuredly needed, an integration between these now unfortunately <coughs> highly separated, uh, 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 highly separated uh, uh, so-called professional activities uh, around a, not, not because they're thrown together, not because they talk about coordination, which is a lot of bunk, but because they are mutually imbued with a new outside objective, which automatically uh, uh, melds them uh, together. And uh, I, I, one of the things I said to Ellis, uh, to uh, Alan, as I was coming in the car is, um, what ideas does Iowa, what ideas is Iowa working on? What are the, is the contribution to national thinking of Iowa at the present moment? And uh, I assure you, coming from the East, that you needn't worry about competition from there. <laughs> because most of those people are running around uh, repeating old cliches as the newest avant-garde idea. And uh, I was uh, uh, very uh, pleased with his reminding me of the Frank Lloyd Wright, and he said that Broadacre City was like Iowa. Well, whether I didn't necessarily agree with that. But I, re I was reminded thereby that Frank Lloyd Wright did not emerge from Philadelphia, New York, Providence. He came from the hills of Wisconsin, as far as I know. And he was one guy who really changed the course of the history of the world. And in a very serious vein, it seems to me entirely logical that this state, which sure in the heck has a lot of land, and which somewhat less than the East is encumbered by unsatisfactory cities, and which uh, presumably still has considerable uh, pliancy of mind, and which has this institution here, which is uh, not so solidified as our Ivy League universities, uh, that frankly it seemed to me entirely logical that this would be a very good place in which the idea would emerge, assert itself, and would suddenly burst out over the United States and the world of an entirely new approach to the professions of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, planning, and civil engineering. And that this would be clarified and would become a clarion call, which it now isn't. And the, the, the great difference, frankly, the great difference between the potential of the career that any one of you could exercise during your next uh, 30 years, the same period of time as I did mine, is the enormous change in the public attitude which your generation has been responsible for bringing about. When I was your age, it was absolutely considered communistic to talk about planning at all. And uh, at least on the East Coast, that's not the attitude at the present time. Uh, uh, but the whole notion of, uh, of real concern about the uh, human ecology of the low-income areas and the whole awareness of the absolute requirement of new ways of doing things because of the ecological problem, because of pollution, because of the awareness of the absolute disaster which faces us, unless we cope with an entirely new set of problems, uh, prime among which is a new way of treating the land. I think this sentence has gotten mixed up. But what I was trying to say is that if you have within yourself the uh, motivation to do it, that any one of you in this room has the possibility of conducting a career on an entirely different plane and with an entirely different uh, degree of effectiveness than was mine. However, I stand before you unequivocally and unapologetically as an indication that it is possible if a person chooses to do so to influence thought on a wide action. Thank you very much.
right? If anybody can survive that, I'll show you this. series of otherwise disparate efforts to bring them into some kind of sense of continuity and, and uh, contiguity and purpose and to establish uh, directions of force and meaningful frames of reference within which, which, with which individual practitioners can relate and which are very clearly uh, capable of growth and extension and movement on and on into uh, more and more of the depths of the city and the region as it develops. And I hope, I hope very deeply that in the process of doing this, I've conveyed to you the point which I tried to make at the very beginning, that the real point of it all is the land. Thank you very much. In other words, uh, <coughs> the land is the point. And I said in the very beginning that you don't have to agree with my idea about how it should be handled. As far as the Society Hill is concerned, it's about, well, a tiny percentage of the total area of Philadelphia. And it is the area of the concentration of all of the great 18th century and the minor 18th century houses. And it was on its way to being totally destroyed, and it would be gone by now if we had not created conditions which meant the people moved in who could keep it in shape. The dislocation was minimal. Uh, and I do believe myself profoundly, but you don't have to agree with this, that the children or the grandchildren of the low-income families will eventually be pleased it was saved, it was the only way to save it. It's only a tiny fragment of the uh, whole program. And I <coughs> didn't develop the point in detail, and I won't unless I'm pressed on it, but the most important thing probably that I ever did in Philadelphia was to move the whole thinking basically about the uh, low-income uh, problem away from the slum clearance idea to the idea of rehabilitating individual houses and to destroying the institutionalization of poverty and so forth and so on. And this we have actually succeeded in getting going at last on a very large scale. Yeah. In McHarg's book, uh, Design with Nature, he has, in, what? in McHarg's book, Design with Nature, yeah. he has several maps of Philadelphia showing economic conditions, social conditions, uh, crime rate distributions, uh, health problem distributions. Uh, your design works to uh, alleviate these in some way by creating new conditions. Well, needless to say, all of the work basically, or most of the work basically, is designed toward improving the environment. Uh, I'm not so naive that I think that 
by improving the environment, you necessarily change the crime rate. And I think that that would also be a rather uh, erroneous idea. And I assure you, it is, isn't our objective to uh, solve crime by what we do. Uh, I think what we feel is that uh, we're just trying as best we can to uh, bring to everybody the possibility of improving their own environment in their own terms. And here, I think, incidentally, another of the great changes in practice between you and my generation is that you really will succeed in bringing the people affected into having a really uh, meaningful role in shaping their own environment. Yeah. It seems it's taken between 20, 20 years from 1952 to 1971 to accomplish what you've done in Philadelphia. What type of problems did you meet in talking with the townspeople and the council? How did you go about solving some criticisms or some that didn't, you know, people didn't like what you were doing? Well, first of all, let me tell you that every single idea that we ever put out was always called absolutely crazy when it first went out. I met with a fellow who said, if I had told the university that they would have this many people uh, by 1971, they would have said I was crazy. And I said, that's where you were wrong. They should have said you were crazy, and then you would have been proved to be right. Because he was afraid of being crazy, he didn't get the credibility of being right. Uh, so that uh, what we actually did, and incidentally, I started out in 1939 in a city in which the politics were abysmal, in which there was the tail end of a decadent Republican regime. And I was appointed executive director under Republican Mayor Bernard Samuel in 49. And in 52, after six suicides, the Democratic mayor came in and he kept me right on. And I then worked through two more aristocratic Democratic mayors and our present Democratic mayor. And uh, it uh, kept right on going. And it was not because I was a skillful politician, nor that I was slightly bit concerned about the subject. It was because I invariably stood forth for some very clear and explicit ideas. And I took the beating which came about by reason of standing for them, and they gradually, of their own volition, inseminated them in people's minds. And this is the essential point that I think so few architects understand. And although I fully agree, you could hardly expect the entire profession to conduct itself in this fashion. I think the tragedy is that the way uh, education works and the way the profession uh, views itself, that nobody emerges to do this kind of thing. Now, I also want to say that uh, in the area which is of, of the deepest concern to you of solving the problem of the ghetto of the model cities and of blighted neighborhoods, that the same principles which are feasible to be fairly spectacularly expressed in Center City uh, can also apply with uh, even more force. The curiosity of success in dealing with uh, blighted neighborhoods is that the product is invisible. The really great conclusion is that you can't even see it, that it's, it's uh, so totally indigenous and so totally uh, related to the life of the people there that it doesn't show as a thing. It just means that the, it really works. the building with the years. Uh, there were battles. Incidentally, there was a, a quite a major battle with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, the New York office came trotting down. Oh, I must tell you, this is much better about Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, <laughs> you know, I talked to you about uh, the paper, the architect's paper. Well, we had a battle with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill because of the border that some draftsman drew around the sheet. Uh, incidentally, this is a very practical suggestion to all architects. Invariably start with at least a half mile every side of your site. Draw the whole darn thing. 
and then move in on the site, but don't touch the site until you've done that. What happened was that a draftsman of see Market East, which Skid Rawlings and Merrill was given the job of doing, uh, is in the middle of the continuity of the city's land. So the draftsman drew a border around it, and Skid Rawlings and Merrill couldn't get out of their mind that the central axis was in the center of the draftsman's border. And so the reality of it was that the central axis of Market East was not in the middle of the block, it was on a street. It was also hard for them to get the idea that the center of their big room was a street, but it was going to be anyway. And so uh, we then uh, had a long and bloody battle, and funny, they moved their axis half a block over, despite the border of the, uh, of the draft room. And uh, <laughs> the, other, the other fight with them was about the uh, higher than City Hall. Uh, I feel very deeply that, and incidentally, if this has any relevance to this campus, it's accidental. I feel very deeply that the skyline is a really important part of the environment. And I think it's absolutely great that the 1870 Victorian ancestors took the fact of the crossing of the two William Penn 1682 movement systems and just lifted it up in the air and stuck it on the top of William Penn's hat, 487 feet in the air. And uh, so Skid Rowings and Merrill came in and said, well, we're going to build a building next to it, which is going to be 86 feet higher than William Penn's hat. Well, I had said prior to that, that when people came in from Philadelphia to ask me, and incidentally, one of the consequences of the whole thing is that many, many private developers came and asked me my opinion about their design, even though they had no requirement to do so at all. And they even, frankly, asked me who they would have as architect. And, uh, they, uh, uh, if they came in and said, well, I have the idea of building this building 10 feet higher than, than Billy Penn. And I would say, well, uh, the fact of the case is that there's been a gentleman's agreement since 1846 that nobody would build higher than William Penn. The only question is whether or not you're a gentleman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that worked with everybody except Skid Moorings and Merrill. <laughs> So they said, to hell with Bacon, and uh, they also put the mayor on their board of directors, and uh, <laughs> he said to me that I had an 18th century mind to be worried about such matters, and uh, nevertheless, I absolutely put my neck on the block and said, over my dead body. And incidentally, uh, I made a personal commitment, and it's quite an unusual commitment, in 1939 especially after having been in Flint, Michigan and gone into real taste of this part of the world, that I would just spend the rest of my days in Philadelphia and that I would put my entire effort on what happened in that particular little piece of God's earth and that to the fullest extent that I was able to do it, I would uh, try to guide it in what I thought was a good direction. And that is the exact opposite of the proper professional attitude, and that is that you exercise your genius where it's appreciated, and if it isn't appreciated, you go on to the next location and the next client. And I do want to make the point that it's just different as A to Z. And so what I was saying, I, I therefore uh, did make the ultimate battle, and curiously enough, I won the damn thing, and uh, we now have an unwritten rule <laughs> that nothing will be more than 490 feet high and nothing has been, and I hope very much nothing ever will be. Uh, as far as the ears are concerned, the next to Independence Hall, uh, this really does have a point because uh, there are two great things necessary. One is that the individual architect be sensitive to the environmental factors of his work. And if he's really a professional, he's absolutely required to think about whether his building will project over the trees and wreck the character of an area or what. But anyway, uh, this next to Independence Hall, Independence Mall, uh, the architects put a building that went way up and then jumped out with two magnificent ears like that and then went back up again. And it was, to say the least, an aggressive and oppressive and an obnoxious design. The only trouble was it was done by the president of the Philadelphia chapter of the American Institute of Architects and the pre former president of the National Institute of Architects. Uh, I, I, took, uh, I took the uh, main guy of the power structure 
who was the head of the All Philadelphia Development Corporation, uh, into my office and showed it to him. And I said, isn't that atrocious? And he said, that is atrocious. <laughs> and then, then, he, then he went out to dinner and he met one of the partners and he came back to me and he said, but the partner's a gentleman. And that was the end of that. Uh, but nevertheless, without his support, I kept on going in this little fight. And it was a very interesting thing because it's, I think it's one of the fairly few examples where an architect just deliberately stands up on the podium and says the work of his fellow stinks. And that's what I said. Nobody listened to me, but happily, uh, happily uh, Wolf von Eckert of the Washington Post got wind of it and he put a marvelous article in the Washington Post. And uh, actually the AIA, we finally got a hold of the uh, head of the General State Authority and he agreed that if something happened, he would review the matter if, if uh, there was real objection. The way we finally convinced him there was real objection. He referred the whole matter to the National American Institute of Architects. They set up a special committee. The special committee met with their peers, but anyway, the final result was the special committee did say, well, it should be redesigned, and in fact it was. And uh, I suppose that was the story you want me to tell. <laughs> but it's simple, easy. You, uh, any of you can do it. And the point of it is, the, the, the real point is that I don't even ask you to like a single thing that I've done. And the marvelous thing is I don't have to win the arguments anymore. anymore. If, if you were uh, in Philadelphia five years ago, I'd absolutely have to convince you but all this stuff's built now so that people can decide later. And uh, so I really don't care uh, because even if you don't like it, somebody will later on. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> my message to you is that, and I feel it very deeply. I have two messages to you. First of all, I've shared with you uh, very fully what I believe to be the new direction of thought. And I think you'll agree that uh, although you may think Society Hill's wrong, that the basic principles I'm talking about, to deal with the land in terms of human institutions, to deal with each uh, organism as an individual entity, and to deal with orientation of the whole thing in your own terms is really the basic uh, direction to go in. And the second part of it is that if you have the energy to really support an idea, you have to have an idea to start with, uh, if you have uh, the ability to communicate that idea, if you have some conviction about what you're doing. And then, incidentally, if you work very hard, uh, it's a good idea to work very hard now and then, why it's absolutely amazing the degree of response which is possible and which will actually occur. And if you remember, I made the point in the beginning about the tyranny of the image and the really incredible destruction that was wrought on families, on communities, on cities, by the misuse of the Le Corbusier, uh, Gropius, low coverage, high rise, light and air image. Uh, I uh, intended to convey to you, and I hope I really did, that there's a ghastly paucity of counter images, that the design profession is preoccupied with individual buildings and uh, individual status relationships. And I think they have done a miserable job of, of creating a new idea of what the new environment ought to be. And there is the tremendous new forces going, which could uh, be harnessed and channeled if they're given uh, the kind of, of articulation in professional terms, which a professional designer should be able to do. I've made it clear, but not so clear as it could be, that as long as you continue in the method of having the architects in one building and the landscape architects in another building and the planners on two floors above and the civil engineers over in a different place, and you all think of each other as separate, uh, it's not going to work. But what I have tried to convey to you is that if anybody really tries to do it, I think it can and
should and will be done on a very large and magnificent scale, so please go out and do it. Thank you. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today you've heard an address by urban planner Edmund Bacon, executive director of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission and the man behind the $2 billion Philadelphia Restoration Project. The lecture was recorded March 11th as part of Focus 1971. <laughs> University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.